Another cannabis week, another mining week, another technology week, yeah. and another crypto week. And the S and P week at new all time highs. Strong every day. That's Jeez, it. how does that happen? I mean, the, the well, conventional wisdom says that nothing goes up forever, but lately the S and P has been sort of bucking that conventional wisdom, and nothing. There seems to be no bad news that can send it in the other direction. Yeah. Short of, of course, when Donald Trump throws a hissy fit and says China deal is off again. Which was the last direct correction yeah. of the downside in the S and P daily. Yeah, and and uh, you know, we we always talk about interest rates. We talk about equities, and we talk about commodities. And it looks like interest rates are creeping ever so slightly higher. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's because they want to normalize that yield curve to a degree. So if I'm a homeowner with a mortgage, does that creeping not yet interest rate make me nervous? Not, not yet. yet. Not yet. But if it, uh, okay. according to G G uh, Jeffrey Gunlock, yeah, he thinks the the, num the number that that has it, it gets through two oh five on the ten year, yeah, then start getting Katie worried. bar the door. Start getting worried. Batten down the hatches. I mean, you, you know, if you're what if you're what if you're a corporation who's got like uh, let's say you're worth a, a six billion dollars and you've got two billion dollars in debt and interest rates are creeping up. Well, there was an article that came out recently about, uh, you know, a few years ago, corporate debt was yielding six and a half per points. Now mm -hmm. it's yielding three and a half points. Like, corporate debt's come down a, a lot, which makes it easier for corporations to borrow. But if for every reason that, if there's a little shock, apparently Amazon's got unbelievable debt. Really? See, I don't, I don't understand why you know, lower rates makes it easier to borrow because I would think that it would be less attractive to lenders to lend. So it would sort of have a concentrating effect on the money supply, but I guess that's never the case when they're printing 20 to $50 billion a year in tier one yeah. capital yeah. that they can then fractionally bank out to a multiple of that number and yeah. just sprinkle like tiny little grains of salt on a beautiful yeah. rump steak. On your wounds, on salt. Your wounds. <laughs> yeah. Oh God! Yeah. Anyway. But so anyway, um, all right. So the S and P continues to march higher, seemingly bulletproof to the impeachment of Donald Trump. Which, <laughs> you know, I found it interesting that the media could interpret that as an impeachment because it's only an impeachment fait accompli if it results in a conviction, isn't it? I mean, y yeah. The yeah. At this point, it should be categorized as the House of Representatives has voted to impeach the president. Right. But the way that the liberal media is categorizing it as Donald Trump has been impeached is kind of like a disingenuous sort of thing that plays into the whole I the know. whole right's hands, suggesting that media has it in for him. It's like you guys got to maintain your absence of bias if you want to maintain your credibility. Cl Clinton was impeached. Clinton was impeached, yeah. but even guys in his own camp, you know, and all. I, I mean, know. I can't, I can't be... I mean, the only one that really was significant that I see, and I wasn't around for the very first one, I guess there's been three, three, yeah. and uh, Trump's now four, no? Right. Nixon. I, I, Nixon, but there was, wasn't there a guy from way back, Monroe, yeah. Monroe, not Monroe, but Madison, or, uh, I don't know, it doesn't matter. We'll look that up. But, but, Can but you tell us in the Nixon, controls? obviously, was, uh, you know, obstruction of justice. I mean, that's a major felony. Well, while you're tapping your opponents, yeah. but, I mean, but... One could argue that that was that is I mean the facts. This is the this is the interesting thing about the right now. So the right interprets this as like this is just a, a grinding axe on the part of the political opponents. The left interprets this as is evidence yes. indisputable that these crimes occurred uh, in terms of the office. But here's the interesting thing: the future doesn't care about your opinion. The future only remembers the facts, and it always gets the facts straight eventually. Does it? Well. I mean, I, it's a, it, there's so much interpretation, you know, it's like when they say uh, France won World War II and yet they lost 20 million people. 
or World War One. I, I mean, it was a b bloody, bloody war. World War One. You know what I'm trying to say? In other words, everybody's got a perspective, right? History. Well, that's right. If you're a, if you're a, if you're a Kurd, yeah, fighting for your homeland, you're a hero. But to the Turks and to the U.S., yeah. you're a terrorist. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it's. So I I, gr I grant that. But so but history. Let's just say that. History never argues with the, the timeline of what happened. You can categorize what yeah. happened as different things from different perspectives, but what actually happened, history never gets that wrong. The, the uh, McConnell, who was involved in the Senate, the leader of the Republican, mm -hmm. you know, he, he came out and said basically, you know, they're impeaching uh, Trump because they don't agree with him. Anyway, of course, he's got a, an agenda. Yeah, we of all, course. everybody. And so, exactly. yeah, I don't know what what what. Uh, Never let the truth get in the way of a good story, I think, is one of the old yeah, saws of Bay yeah, Street. Yeah, old saws, yeah. Old saw. I remember this old saw. I remember that old saw. We have a great show today. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Alan Broxian is going to join us from 420 Invest. After uh, Alan, we're going to hear from Charting Man Dan from thechartguys.com. Always a welcome guest. And then following that, Green Lane Holdings CFO Ethan Rudin will be here to explain his company's business model and future prospects. And following him, we're going to have George Robinson talk about the patent infringement that uh, they're, they're embroiled with currently. And then we'll wrap it up with Dr. Alan W. Davidoff from Zortex Therapeutics, a company that is focused on curing kidney disease associated with diabetes. All that and more today. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Make sure you never miss a show by subscribing to our YouTube channel and clicking on the little notifications bell. If you're interested in getting monthly actionable investment ideas in the cannabis space to your inbox, subscribe to the newsletter at MidasLetter.com. I'm joined now by Alan Brockstein, publisher of 420 Invest. Alan, welcome. Hey, it's good to be back, James. You bet. Uh, Alan, we saw the sort of bottom up here in the technicals in the cannabis sector uh, and then as you just said then we weren't and so uh, what in yeah. your view has happened in sector wide to sort of cause a resumption in the pessimism demonstrated in the sentiment of the market itself yeah it's been a, a very tough year and trying to call bottoms has been uh, challenging uh, I think I've officially done it twice and uh, technically failed again but I, th I think we are in a bottoming process. And I think, you know, right now we're faced with, uh, you know, the ongoing concerns about funding. And we've seen a lot of uh, down rounds and aggressive capital raises. And that's weighing on the sector, I believe. And, you know, there's just, you know, everything that comes out is a little bit disappointing. For example, uh, yes, it's good Ontario is moving forward in uh, moving to uh, uh, an open system as opposed to a lottery, you know, a merit-based system, but it's only 20 stores a month. That's, you know, a lot less than people wanted to see. So it's a slow pace and they're keeping the central distribution for now, which is, which is uh, no bueno. So I think uh, up in Canada, it's just been just a brutal year and it's, uh, you know, everybody's watching, uh, to see when it ends. Uh, I, I would just point to some of the largest LPs seem to be holding their bottoms. And we had a pretty sharp sell-off in uh, a lot of the smaller ones. Uh, that might be tax tax uh, loss selling, for example. And some of them have bounced back pretty sharply, James. In the United States, you know, some of the largest MSOs have held their lows, uh, like GTI, TrueLeave, even with yesterday, PureLeaf, whereas some of the smaller ones also uh, seem to be facing some pressure. Yeah, you bet. So. Um TrueLeave was the target of a short report, which uh, I saw the share price collapse, and I thought, oh my gosh, what happened? Then I saw it was a short report. I didn't ha haven't actually had a chance to read it. What is your take on that, the, the representations made in that short report? Yeah, you know, I think I, I have no problem with people being negative, and uh, I have no problem with even with the business model, which is, you know, they're... They, they front load, they short, and then they go out and tell everybody. That's fine. I mean, everybody's an adult and they should understand the game. Uh, and I, I really don't have a problem with anything in there per se. It's not like they're outright lies, but I would say there's definitely some factual issues. And I, I think it comes down to <clears throat> that person has written about the sector before. I don't think they know the sector very well. And they said some things about True Leave that were pretty silly. Like, for example, Truly, you know, we've been dealing with this problem of uh, biological assets. It's mandated by IFRS accounting, not in GAAP. 
A lot of these companies are moving the gap, by the way, next year, which will be interesting. But for now, biological accounting is a fact of life. And I have never seen TrueLeave do anything but be perfectly open and upfront about the impact on their income statement. And uh, yet the short report made it seem like they were doing something untoward uh, with respect to their profitability, which has been exaggerated by biological assets. The company's gone out of its way to explain that. So that was one issue. You know, uh, the company has leading market share in, in Florida. There's no problem with their quality or with uh, anything like that, but they're pointing, you know, trying to point fingers at hoop houses. And, uh, you know, a lot of what they sell is uh, extracts and it's grown, you know, it's, it, you know, you don't have to have the highest quality like an indoor grow, but their flower that's sold is grown indoors. So I just feel like the report was, uh, you know, lacking. Now, with that said, I have been cautious on a few issues about TrueLeave, uh, in particular, some related party transactions, and also just uh, the fact that the CEO's husband is under uh, trial. And, uh, you know, you never know if that's going to push back to the company or not, uh, but it's just a headline risk that I've been cognizant of. Sure. Okay. Any bright spots out there in cannabis world as far as you're concerned? Bright spots. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to be tough. The, the bright spot is the prices are, are quite low. And, uh, you know, it's hard to, you know, it's really easy after the fact to say, oh, yeah, those prices were stupidly high or, oh, yeah, those prices were stupidly low. And I, I don't think they're stupidly low right now. But, uh, you know, I have a friend uh, and he goes back three decades and he's a value investor and very uh, tactical and institutional investor. And He's been picking my brain the last few days. And I, I think that kind of tells you the reality. It, it's, uh, uh, you know, I'm in, in Houston and uh, you got to watch out during those hurricanes for the, the, the eye of the storm because the storm comes back. So hopefully we're not in the eye, but uh, it does feel like uh, we're, we're coming out of just a, a, a terrible uh, storm. And uh, I'm optimistic about next year. And I, I think... Uh, Canada is it's a little harder to be optimistic until uh, because the things that are going to drive Canada are, are on a delay. You know, the Ontario stores and the uh, cannabis 2.0, these things are going to be slow to roll out. So it, it, it's I think some of the prices in Canada uh, for some of the less complicated, larger LPs uh, are really low. And so, you know, maybe there's a chance that, that you can make some decent money ahead of those catalysts in those names. But in the U.S., I, I think things are exciting, and I can't remember if we've talked about it, but Illinois is legalizing on January 1st. I think I wrote about it this week, and I think this is going to go down as one of the best legalizations ever. And, uh, you know, I don't I feel like people aren't really looking at it now. To be fair, uh, there's going to be supply constraints on day one. But Illinois is opening up with more more stores open on January 1st than Ontario has a year later after uh after legalizing Ontario is like three times the size, or not three times, it's larger. Sorry, it's not three times. It's 50% larger, I believe, than in uh, Illinois. So point being, a lot better situation. And uh, there's a lot going on in the United States that's positive. I think Pennsylvania, uh, we're going to see some pressure on a lot of states as the year plays out. Uh, we'll see either ballot initiatives or even legislative moves. And I just saw New Jersey apparently is going to vote if they don't go through the legislative route next year. And Florida, Arizona, these are states that could vote. <clears throat> you could see uh, states like Minnesota go the legislative route. So I, I think in the U.S. there's going to be uh, a lot of catalysts throughout the year. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, do you see any long-term fallout that might represent a downsizing in the market size from the vape health issues that have sort of plagued us this year is it do you see it that becoming a bigger thing like the uh, Boeing 737 no I, I don't think so I, I think uh, to the contrary uh, it was a nice wake-up call uh, I you know I've been concerned about vaping hardware and the vape uh, you know concentrates additives that there's just not a lot of knowledge around them obviously in the black market it's a lot worse so I think the industry got a taste of, of what a crisis can look like. Uh, it seems to be behind us. Even the one state that banned it, Massachusetts, is uh, opening up again. And it was good to see no other states took that kind of rash move like Massachusetts did. 
uh, during the November reporting season, uh, every company I listened to said that it had already passed. So uh, I think there'll be, you know, maybe a little bit of overhang over time. Uh, but the reality is, uh, this is a chance to get some of the illicit market consumers into the regulated market. It's a wake up call to them in particular, because they are going on the trust me stuff with no verification at all. And I think that the legal market has the opportunity to win over people that, you know, people shop at Whole Foods and all sorts of organic places really care about what's going into their bodies. They should care what's going into their lungs, James. And I think this is uh, a nice uh, wake up call to consumers and to the industry. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, do you think that the persistence of the black market is going to weigh on earnings of companies in Canada and the U.S.? And if so, are there states that are where it's more prevalent than others and where they're doing a better job of controlling the black market? Or do you think that that's just a problem that's going to be a feature of the cannabis industry for, uh, you know, the next 100 years? Yeah, I don't know about the next hundred years, but yeah, it's a feature. Even in Colorado, which I think is finally overcoming the black market, there's been a resurgence in growth in Colorado and pricing has gone up. And I haven't seen anybody really dig into it or write about it, but it, it to me, it looks like uh, the black market is losing some share in Colorado. But this is a big problem in Canada and California in particular. Right. And the problem isn't one only by government enforcement. You cannot government enforce the illicit market away by itself. You need to win the consumer over. And you do that with good products, with information about your products and convenience. And the illicit markets had a lot of advantages, especially where you are in Canada, uh, where you know there aren't enough stores, there's not delivery, things like that. So, and not the right form factor. So I, I think it takes time. I think, uh, you know, we're seeing some enforcement in California uh, big time, both on the retail stores that are illegal, as well as operators who, who are illegal. And so uh, I think it, it takes all of that. You can't rely on just enforcement from the government. You can't just mandate the illicit market away. I think the industry itself, uh, you know, I hear it all the time. I was listening to the fire and flower call yesterday, for example, the illicit market remains the biggest competitor. And that's the right mindset. Instead of worrying about what your legal competitors doing, everybody needs to be thinking about how can we make it better and more convenient and cheaper for the consumer. You bet. All right, Alan, that's a great uh, contribution as usual. I thank you very much for your input and I will see you next week. Oh no, I won't. It's Christmas time. All right, take care. Merry Christmas. If you're enjoying the show, subscribe to Midas Letter on YouTube so you stay up to date on everything investment. So Alan doesn't seem to put too much stock in the uh, short report from those bandits. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, the, the, the interesting thing from where I sit, you know, the stock was 16 and now it's 1360, you know, so. But if somebody, if you're in a building and somebody yells fire, do you say, wait a sec, I'm going to look at the track record of who's shouting fire and I'm going to determine whether I see or smell any smoke, and then I'm going to see how the water supply is to see what the risk really is, or do you just run like fuck out of the building on the off chance that there's freaking fire burning? Exactly. Yeah. Investors are like that. It's like run for the hills and then ask questions later. So this is one of the fundamental problems with the regulation of short strategists. If you mislead an investor into buying stock based on a representation that things are better than they seem and therefore you should buy because it's going to go up. Similarly, guys who yell fire in a house that is not even burning and catalyze a stock drop should yeah. be guilty of a stock manipulation and this is a default or rather a, a deficiency in the regulation in both Canada and the US. That's my position. Okay. Well, we've seen we've seen it. I mean, you know, if you listen to Citron when they first blasted uh, Kronos, you would have got your ass handed to you. Good point. You know, so so things yeah. things happen. The question is, are they going to run back in here? Because I think they're up to forty two dispensaries now. Yeah. They're following a, a, a formula oh, yeah. which seems to work. Well, um, and and to bear in mind that as as uh, as is was made the case, the uh, the information brought to light by this so-called short strategist is actually like ancient information. Yeah. Everybody who's invested knows it. So 
Kind of interesting. Anyway, so uh, yeah, okay. we are going to follow and have uh, another comment from our old friend charting man Dan McDermott on exactly that as well. I'm joined now by charting man Dan McDermott from thechartguys.com. Dan, welcome back. Glad to be back. Thanks for having me. Dan, the uh, market was starting to look like last time we chatted, the technicals were suggesting that the bottom was in. Then we saw a bit of a sell-off earlier in the week. Uh, what was the cause of that? And is that consistent with your, your sort of thesis going forward that the, the sort of bottom is materializing a bit? So it's still just bears having confidence where we know that this bounce was going to give us a weekly lower high. We changed the daily trend. That's a great start. It's just giving us a weekly lower high. The longer term signals from prolonged downtrends that I have had success with in the past are weekly trend changes. And that's going back to CGC in 2017 in the $7 range and also going back to Bitcoin in the $4,000 range when it first changed its weekly trend after a prolonged downtrend. So that is what this sector needs to head into the start of the year 2020. And part of what is required to change the weekly trend is coming off of a bottom, changing the daily trend, getting a nice bounce, but then losing that daily uptrend to set the weekly higher low. And that might be a little bit difficult to understand, but I'll point out in the charts in a bit exactly what I mean. But essentially it is the last part of despair where we lose the daily uptrend, the bulls say, oh great, here we go again. We're about to fade back down. We see that last bit of despair. We hold the recent low, set the weekly higher low, and then shift that momentum. So that is the only hope for the bulls to shift this sector sentiment to start 2020. Sure. I'm assuming you keep one eye on the sort of the fundamental drivers out there that are probably come to affect your technical indicators. Do you see anything happening in the early part of 2020 that would constitute a fundamental you know, uh, signal that the technicals might be about to change? I think it would have to be something that surprises us because at this point we have uh, legalization 2.0 in Canada. That's a known event. We have the US having less and less hope of the SAFE Act going anywhere in the near term. So there is nothing that is looming. And that's usually the way that it goes where, you know, if it were a known event, it would be already priced in. So pending any surprise, it is going to be, in my opinion, just a straight up technical signal that won't have a fundamental reason for it. That being said, I would welcome a surprise bullish fundamental development that would jumpstart the bulls and make that pattern play out. Right. Okay, uh, now also I think one of the things that sort of threw the market back into a bit of a sell-off was this uh, short report came out on TrueLeave, which has to date been sort of the leading market darling in the last phase of this big correction. And that suddenly catalyzed a sell-off in TrueLeave shares. And, but looking at the information, uh, it's nothing new, and uh, yet it, nonetheless it catalyzed a big sell-off. What was your sort of take on that? Yeah, very similar. Uh, if you were invested in TRUL and you did not you know this information, that's a red flag to tell you you need to do a better job of due diligence because this is all known information. Personally, I do not have a long-term TRUL position because that has been the overhanging cloud that I have been cautious of. I know that there's this FBI investigation. I know that that has not been resolved yet. And I know that it could potentially trickle down having impact on TRUL. So that has been a known event. And clearly it was used to strike fear into this market. And the herd, which is, you know, retail traders are very easily manipulated with their emotions. And these short sellers certainly take advantage of that. I see. So in your view, is that a uh, something that should be ignored when somebody comes out with information that's just rearranged in a way to cast the company in a negative light and trigger a short? Or is that something that investors need to nonetheless pay attention to? You need to pay attention to it for sure because obviously it has a significant impact and it's the kind of thing where I read that information and then we all looked at the chart guys to buy the dip that day and I looked to buy that dip because it was known information. If it were unknown information being brought to light that the market had not been able to adequately price in at that point, I would have been much more patient trying to play a bounce play. But it's the kind of thing where we say, okay, the market for the most part has priced this in. We now have this short-term influx of bearish pressure 
because of this report, but that often leads to a dip buying opportunity, which in the case of TRUL, I think that day from low of the day to the high of the bounce was an 18% bounce. So certainly opportunity knowing that it was no new information. Yeah, you bet. All right, Dan, let's, uh, let's go take a look at the charts now and see what they're telling us. So the first thing we're going to look at here on CGC is the daily time frame where we have a higher low uptrend. And I'm going to mark the higher lows that are most important to me on the way up. And right now we're trying to form another higher low. We have a tight inside bar range currently forming today. Depending on how the day ends, if this inside bar on Monday were to break bullish, then I would say this is our new daily higher low of 1945. We don't have enough follow through off of that point yet to call that our new daily higher low. But let's just say that 1945 does end up being our new daily higher low and the bulls start next week with a little bit of green, not enough to break the top of the bounce 2225, and then they roll over and lose the daily uptrend. At that point, you're going to see bulls all over social media lamenting and complaining and talking about how bearish the sector is. And it's the kind of scenario where we have to lose that daily uptrend. This is now the weekly chart to look for a weekly higher low to form. So I am watching this pattern where we bounced on the weekly time frame and topped out at 22.48. We then dumped to our low. We rejected with a lower high compared to 22.48 at 22.25. And now if we lose the daily uptrend to start to either end 2019 or start 2020, we then have to hold the low of the dump, which I think the bulls will be able to do because that's down at 13.81. And we are currently still what, 25 plus percent above that level? Even if we lose the daily uptrend, if we pull back to $18, we will still be a significant amount of percentage points above that low. Then we have to change the daily trend back to the bulls, form that weekly higher low, break those two resistances, and change the weekly trend for the first time since this, weekly, since this weakness started back in April. That is the must happen scenario for me to be bullish to start 2020. So you're going to see a lot of people giving up if we do lose that daily uptrend and start to consolidate for that weekly higher low. A lot of bulls are going to give up, but we will be continuing to watch for this weekly higher low to try and form. So we're doing a lot of looking ahead. First things first, we have to lose the daily uptrend, which has not happened yet. But for CGC and APHA, they both have the same setup on the weekly time frame, And that's because they are two of the stronger names comparative to ACB and Cron, which have been a bit weaker in comparison. So looking at TRUL, we have the reaction to the dump, the significant size of the bounce, and now we're fading back down again. So at this point, trading is at the mercy of the range established on that dump and bounce. And yes, absolutely, this is a news event or a short report, if you want to call that a news event. Either way, it's a news event that significantly is impacting the charts. That being said, First things first, short term, we're going to be looking at this tightening four hour range. We have the low of the dump, the high of the bounce, and I'm looking for a four hour higher low compared to 1206 and for this four hour range to tighten to start next week. But viewers of your show will remember that we were on here talking about TRUL's monthly time frame sometime in the last month or so. And we were looking for a lower high to be set compared to 2165. So while yes, this short report is absolutely impacting the charts, it's giving us the lower high that we were anticipating. It's just happening a lot faster than I would have anticipated. So all time high, all time low, lower high, higher low, lower high. And we're gonna be looking for a monthly higher low to form compared to 991. We are currently $4.50 below our resistance and about $3.59 above our support. So fairly close to the middle of the range. And we'll be watching for this monthly pattern to tighten up to start 2020 and we'll be looking for a break sometime mid 2020. So these are all things that we're watching from mid to longer term setups. And again, the sector must change weekly trends for me to say that we have a clear sentiment shift in the sector. And what keeps me hopeful or at least watching the bulls and giving them a chance is again, this the amount of space that we have to work with to form the weekly higher lows before we drop down to the lows of the dump. Right now, CGC has 30% to work with. So let's just, I don't usually do much predicting, but I would say best case scenario as far as the most clear setup happening that I want to see, 
I want to see the Bulls start next week with some green. I want to see the inability to break 22, 25 resistance. If we break that resistance level, obviously that's nice for the sector, but the weekly trend change will still be needed. But looking for the lower high, if we then roll over, set a daily lower high and lower low by breaking 1945 support, then we zoom out to the weekly time frame. We patiently wait for the daily trend to change back to the bulls. We look for a weekly higher low to be formed somewhere in the $17 to $18 range. And then we look for the bulls early 2020 to try and break 22.25 and 22.48 resistance for the clear trend change and clear shift in momentum for the sector bulls to regain a bit of control. We'll see how it plays out. We'll be tuning in day by day. And this is the kind of thing where I don't make any bets based on this happening. I don't lock myself into positions. I don't understand why people do that with trading where they make a claim for something months down the road. Every single day of trading, we get more and more information that can allow us to make a more and more informed guess or uh, bet on the likely scenario to play out. So locking yourself in to something happening two months down the road and then ignoring the day-by-day -day information that we get is really limiting yourself from having all the information available. Thanks very much for joining us again, Dan. Visit Dan McDermott at thechartguys.com. Thanks a lot. See you next time, James. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Make sure you never miss a show by subscribing to our YouTube channel and clicking on the little notifications bell. If you're interested in getting monthly actionable investment ideas in the cannabis space to your inbox, subscribe to the newsletter at MidasLetter.com. So uh, Dan also doesn't put much stock in that short report, even though he acknowledges that. that, that he said that that was a shoe that could derail an investment. Yeah. So he's, 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 he's obviously doing his due diligence, isn't he? Yeah. But proof positive, again, that this is really an unregulated segment of the market that is constitutes a moral, or sorry, a moral. Speaking about the stock market in, the, in terms of morality is just like, forget it. You're just barking up the wrong tree. But yeah. no, but that is, in, in, that is a clear, clearly deficiently regulated segment of the market that allows bad actors to be predatory against legitimate investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, anyways. Well, I'm sure this, this is nothing new, right? We've seen this time and time again. Like, yeah. Jeez. You know. Yeah. And, and and when you know when these things catch a bid, like if there's a short cover or rally, they go they go ballistic. You bet. Coming up next, our guest is one of the companies that is involved with the uh, the making of the picks and shovels of the cannabis industry. And this company has a lot more going for it than you might care to know. And we'll be right back with that conversation. Green Lane Holdings CFO Ethan Rudin joins me now. Ethan, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. You bet. Ethan, in a nutshell, what is the business of Green Lane Holdings? Well, Green Lane is the largest provider of ancillary devices and implements for the consumption of e nicotine, uh, CBD, and mostly cannabis. Um, we are dominant in our channel of trade, which is approximately 7,000 customers serving 11,000 doors. And those doors are made up of um, smoke shops, vape shops, and other places where they'll sell ancillary consumption products. And um, one of our amazing competitive advantages is the relationships that we enjoy in the industry with both suppliers and, and our customers alike. We provide um, the most premium um, branded uh, ancillary products. So, for example, we're exclusive distributors in our channels of trade with PAX. Um, we sell and we're the first to distribute in the United States the Storts and Bickle Volcano. Um, and effectively, any brand in ancillary where it's an iconic name to cannabis consumers 
um, that's what we're selling. Um, we also have our own suite of house brands. Um, we have a brand of rolling papers called uh, Vibes. We have uh, glass uh, that we license IP from uh, Keith Herring and from uh, Marley Natural, where we're making smoking and um, ancillary products. Uh, we have a collaboration with Jonathan Adler um, and, high, and our brand Higher Standards, which is not just a standalone retail concept, but also a brand of products. Um, and so we're actually a fairly complex business. We also have a supply and packaging division. Uh, we do channel and drop ship, and we do a significant amount of e-commerce on our own sites as well as fulfillment for others. Uh, but the majority of our business, as I uh, started off with, is our servicing of the 11,000 doors and 7,000 customers in the independent channel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is your, you just get started trading publicly in April this year, which is, uh, you know, probably the worst, the worst thing that could have happened to you. But so give me a sense of your, your financial footprint at this, ter at this time in terms of uh, annual revenue and revenue rate of growth. Yeah. So um, last last quarter, um, we're, we're approximately a two hundred million dollar revenue company. Um, our long term growth rates are um, twenty five percent annual net um, revenue growth on the top line. Long term, this is what we're communicating to the street. Uh, we're communicating a long term uh, gross margin of twenty percent and a long term adjusted EBITDA margin of ten percent. Um, we've recently gone out and acquired a, uh, a footprint in the Netherlands, Conscious Wholesale, so that we can reach 20 new markets that we have not been in previously. Um, you know, one of the reasons we actually went public was to effectuate um, a roll-up strategy and roll up the best brands and platforms in distribution of ancillary. Uh, we think about our acquisitions both in terms of horizontal to fortify our market position and our footprint, and then also vertical, adding to our house brands. Uh, this is our ability to control our own destiny versus being um, captive to the innovation life cycle and branding of some of the people that we distribute. So uh, we really like the margin profile in these house brands. But getting back to your original comment on the IPO and, and timing as such, I mean, I, I would say that given where um, the industry is headed um, since April, uh, arguably we're sitting on 100 million of working capital. Um, we have a very, very strong balance sheet and really, really excited and arguably the only thing that's changed for us since the IPO is that um, whereas we intended to use our equity currency as a vehicle for acquisition, um, now obviously uh, we, we have the same aspirations to, to grow through acquisition. However, um, now having to use uh, mostly cash and structures uh, with earnouts back end weighted according to targets, it just forces you to be a lot more disciplined and a lot more patient. Um, when it comes to valuation. And so we're actually very, very pleased with our timing. We're very, very pleased uh, with where we sit and while the aftermarket performance of the stock, we would have uh, hoped to have done a lot better given that we've effectively done just about everything that we said we were going to do since the IPO. We, we really like our, our, our position and our capitalization heading into 2020 and couldn't be any more excited for what's to come for Greenlane. Yeah, you bet. Well, I'm looking at your website and all your brands here. I recognize almost all of them. And uh, you can't control the market. And I know that there is a third wave of, uh, of investment coming, probably coincident with the U.S. deprohibition of cannabis in the United States. And you're obviously well positioned for that. Um, so I would think that the acquisition targets in your universe have also become much cheaper to acquire. You know, they, they have, but obviously M&A um, is, is a, um, a, a disciplined muscle that we try to flex um, with a level of, of um, you know, just being discerning on what's going to strategically help us grow. Um, obviously, being a public company, we're focused on being accretive to our growth, being accretive to our margin and profitability out of the gate of our targets. We're not really out looking to acquire projects. We need to see uh, profitability at, out of the gate. You know, obviously, a lot of what's happening in in the markets around the sector. Um, you know, nobody is rewarding growth at at all costs anymore. There is a uh, a flight to folks who have um, shown a level of discipline in their operations. 
um, uh, the ability to pivot quickly and be profitable. The one really nice thing about our business is the company has historically always been profitable and we've been setting up for growth post the IPO. And while the world's changed on us slightly, um, you know, we're in the middle of a strategic pivot to um, rationalize the SKUs that we sell, um, try and to increase the amount of house brands that we sell so that we can control more of our gross margin. Um, and again, we're just very, very excited about what the future holds for us. We're very optimistic. Sure. How has the entire uh, health scare associated with vaping affected your long-term outlook and how do you mitigate the damage from that and the future exposure to risk from that? It's, it's a really great question and, and I think that while obviously we're, we, we take it very seriously and we um, always have a long-term lens and are always looking to do the right thing. It's a uh, predominant number one reason why I actually joined the company before the IPO. Um, look, I mean, it, 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 it begs the discussion. And, and I think that a lot of what's occurred in, in the recent vaping quote-unquote crisis is, uh, frankly, a, a lot of misinformation. Um, first, first and foremost, what you have on the nicotine side is uh, not terribly dissimilar to what people have experienced with uh, what I'll characterize as the Joe Camel issue. Um, you know, cigarettes should not be marketed to children and any perception that cigarettes are being marketed to children um, is now has its its metaphor in the e-cigarette space and, and Juul is suffering through that a, along with us as well. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, that's, that's something that will be talked about, I'm sure, in, in perpetuity marketing these products to children is inherently wrong. And, um, you know, obviously we're not making accusations, but um, that will be a constant exploration um, and the court of public opinion has clearly weighed in. The second thing that, that we've discovered had been going on is um, illicit and illegal THC being sold in the black market with cutting agents such as vitamin E acetate as an example of something that's been discovered. Uh, what I would say is that when you uh, purchase something illegally in the black market, you're, you're putting yourself through some undue risk. And I don't know that it's terribly fair to accuse the entire industry of um, maliciousness and malfeasance because of a couple of bad actors. And if anything, it's it's a really fabulous argument as to why this should be sensibly regulated and taxed and monitored. And so as a result, we at Greenlane are, are, are really, really uh, supportive of sensible regulation. We want things sold in age-gated um, settings. And um, like I said, we're always prepared to take the long term view and do the right thing. And as a result, I think our behavior as such has ensured that we're going to be around for a very long time and stewards of the industry, making sure that we don't experience uh, the same type of crisis that um, has happened before. I mean, we're playing our part very actively. We have a real um, uh, tradition of regulatory compliance and auditing through, um, you know, our merchandising decisions and track and trace of what we do sell. So, um, if anything, we are a beacon of hope for what this industry could look like if you were to ask me. You bet. All right, Ethan, we're out of time here. That's a great introduction. I will come back to you soon. Best of luck and thanks for joining me today. Really appreciate you having me on. Thanks for extending me the time. If you're enjoying the show, subscribe to Midas Letter on YouTube so you stay up to date on everything investment. The next guest up is from the biotech sector, and biotech is one of those sectors where if you get it right, you can make a ton of money in a short space of time. Stay tuned for that. I'm joined now by Zortex Therapeutics, Inc. CEO, Dr. Alan Davidoff. Alan, how are you? I'm great, James. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Uh, Alan, quickly refresh the audience's memory. What is it exactly that Zortex Therapeutics is doing? Well, Zortex is working on two um, separate drug programs for two progressive kidney diseases, one in uh, type 2 diabetic nephropathy and a second in a smaller orphan disease, polycystic kidney disease. Mm -hmm. So when you say an orphan disease, what exactly does that mean? Well, orphan diseases are considered rare diseases where there's less than 200,000 individuals in the U.S. or, uh, you know, similarly small populations of individuals who have few therapeutic options but a great need in terms of their health and the acuteness of uh, the disease. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, um, 
Essentially, Zortex is a biotechnology play then from the investor, investor perspective, correct? Yeah, that's right. We're a drug development, research and development company. We're focused on these two kidney diseases, as I mentioned, and in late stage clinical trials. So in the case of the polycystic kidney disease program, recent discussions with the FDA uh, have shown us a path through a small phase three registration trial, and that should within three and a half years or so lead us to a marketing application and then subsequently a year after we should be in a position to start marketing the drug and so become cash flow positive. Mm -hmm. With regard to the type 2 diabetic nephropathy program, we have a co-development deal with uh, Tejin Pharma of Japan to develop a molecule that we feel very strongly is a next generation molecule and ideally suited because of of some of its special characteristics to uh, work very well in patients with progressive kidney disease due to type 2 diabetic nephropathy. Right. Okay. Uh, tell me about the uh, the disease itself that this is this is uh, uh, addressing. What kind of disease is it? What's what are, what are sort of the the characteristics of it? Why is it such an important project for Zortex? Right. Well, I, I think, um, you know, one, to put things in a global perspective, right now diabetes patients are treated with uh, blood pressure lowering drugs and glucose control drugs. But beyond that, there are really no approved therapies for progressive kidney disease in, in a way that would slow the progression or stabilize the progression and even in some cases reverse that progression. It's a large market. Uh, in the U.S., there are about 10 million individuals with progressing kidney disease. In uh, the world, that number is more like 100 million folks who have no real therapeutic options. What we've seen from a number of very nice, uh, independently run clinical studies is that uric acid is problematic. It acts as a bad actor in the pro progress of kidney disease. And when one lowers uric acid by a variety of means, uh, and more specifically the means that we're developing, you see this clinical benefit that is substantial and, and quite impressive compared to the standard of therapy that exists right now. So we're very, um, you know, we're very strong in the opinion that these studies have de-risked what we're doing substantially. It bodes well for the future and we certainly think that the, the translational risk to marketing approval is uh, decreased. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is the uh, what is the next twelve months look like, and what are the catalysts that will sort of drive value in terms of the markets? Yeah, so we have a um, announced uh, broker private placement uh, that's underway right now. We hope to close that very uh, soon. That will provide us with the funds that then set up. Uh, a move to larger markets like the NASDAQ, uh, but it also gives us the funds to uh, work towards establishing starting the phase three registration trial in polycystic kidney disease in uh, the late summer or fall of this year. And what we need to do in order to accomplish that is manufacture a clinical supply of drug for uh, that polycystic kidney disease phase three trial, complete some regulatory filings with regard to uh, the orphan status and the investigational new drug application and then that sets us up very nicely for a short uh, bioavailability bioequivalent study and then that is the stepping stone for starting the phase three trial. Mm -hmm. How much money in total has gone into this company and the development of these products? Prior to Zortex's aggregating uh, the patent portfolio that, that covers a whole disease axis that begins with prediabetes through the health consequences of diabetes, about $10 million was spent. We have, since the inception of the company, raised $4 million and advanced the technology now to uh, these late stage statuses for, for each of those programs, uh, phase two in diabetic nephropathy and phase three in polycystic kidney disease. Sure. sure. So uh, is this got the potential to become a blockbuster drug in the realm of diabetes in your opinion? Yeah, our financial modeling, some of which has been done with uh, 
experienced licensing uh, executives and uh, also with our uh, co-development deal with Tejin suggests that for polycystic kidney disease in the U.S. the market is approximately 1.8 billion per year during the seven-year uh, life of the exclusivity period that you're granted with an orphan uh, and about twice that for the world in with regards to the type 2 diabetic nephropathy program our uh, best estimates are that peak sales for a 10-year product life begin at about uh, year four and are about 2.4 billion per year in the US and about twice that in the world so if you use the five billion dollar of revenue per year mark as your threshold for a blockbuster then yes uh, certainly one if not both of those programs fit quite nicely into uh, that category mm -hmm. so what exactly do diabetic patients do now to treat their their disease or their condition uh, in terms of improving quality of life Right. So the, the, generally, if you have diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you, um, you have available to yourself really three classes of drugs, blood pressure lowering drugs, the standard uh, antihypertensive drugs, sugar control drugs that control blood glucose levels, and then more recently there are a class of drugs, the uh, SGLT inhibitors. All of those tend to treat non-kidney issues um, there really is nothing right now for someone with progressive kidney progressive kidney disease that's uh, initiated either by polycystic kidney disease or by uh, type 2 diabetic nephropathy so while you can control your your hypertension and your blood glucose the reality is the evidence is overwhelming that there is a uh, series of symptoms that arise and become more and more aggregated, aggravated over time when uric acid is increased even at or above the average normal level. So especially in the case of diabetic nephropathy patients, kidneys become exquisitely sensitive to uric acid levels. That increases their risk profile for injury to their kidneys and so there's a compelling reason to lower uric acid in patients with diabetes and even the first symptoms of uh, elevated uric acid. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so how is, how is uric acid generated and, and how does it sort of get out of control to the point where it causes diabetes? Yeah, there are a variety of, of ways that uric acid is elevated. In some cases, it's increased by diet. Certainly, it's associated with... with um, obesity and and uh, an overweight uh, state things like yeasty foods um, shellfish uh, fructose is the worst uh, for example fructose in soft drinks in a variety of refined foods can drive up your uric acid even within hours and if you're consuming those foods on a regular basis you you tend to drive up your uric acid chronically and that's where uh, broad uh, inflammatory systemic inflammation happens and and then you know you should recognize that um, for many individuals with diabetes or with high uric acid levels gout rheumatoid arthritis and kidney uh, problems have been associated together for quite a while mm -hmm. okay so what is the uh, just a quick question I'm, and I ask this because I start every day with a large bowl of fresh cut organic fruit and is consuming fructose from that natural source is that actually increasing my risk of diabetes caused by uric acid uh, no I think consuming the amounts of fruit and vegetables you can eat on a daily basis isn't such a concern um, orange juice for example that has added sugar probably would be good to avoid okay but great to know uh, in general raw and fresh uh, fruits and vegetables are just fine okay good to know all yeah. right dr davidoff we will leave it there for now thank you very much for the update we'll come back to you soon 
My pleasure. Good to talk to you, James, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to the Midas Letter. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Make sure you never miss a show by subscribing to our YouTube channel and clicking on the little notifications bell. If you're interested in getting monthly actionable investment ideas in the cannabis space to your inbox, subscribe to the newsletter at MidasLetter.com. I'm joined now by George Robinson, CEO of RavenQuest Biomed. George, welcome back. Always great to be with you, James. George, I understand you filed a response to the uh, patent infringement claim that was recently made against RavenQuest Bio and your technology. Yeah, we did. We re responded yesterday, and I'm really happy uh, to let everyone know where we're at with it. It's still in the courts, but we filed our response with uh, our claim of no infringement. Further, we submitted a 350-page document, electronic binder, uh, to the court uh, further suggesting that uh, Rotogro's uh, patents are invalid. Oh, okay. Um, and on what basis do you think that their patents are invalid? Well, we kind of looked at this, uh, and we knew about this going into this. We've researched this back a couple of years ago, but there is a lot of prior art, and I've been talking about prior art for quite some period of time. Mm -hmm. But if you go back, we see prior art back to 1970, right through the 80s the 90s. Uh, we found uh, 350 some odd uh, re representations of claims or patents of prior art uh, in the past. Um, we've actually looked at exactly all the prosecution that went through on Rotogro filing their claim. Uh, with that, uh, we were very well prepared for a response. And uh, like I said, 350 pages, which is going to uh, make this an uh, interesting uh, thing for the courts to review. Uh, we feel that we've done an exhaustive review based on our previous research and our uh, near-term research that we've done. And I think cautiously optimistic is uh, the minimum, I would suggest, if not better, and how we're going to deal with this claim. Wow, fantastic. All right, so do you think that that's uh, largely what's been weighing down on the share price? Is this perception in the public that, uh, that there is potentially a leg to stand on legally for this other company? You know, I think you're right there. I think there was some baked in, uh, you know, price compression on the stock once that notice came out. It was roughly, we were roughly at just above 20, uh, 20 cents. This came out and we've dropped down and now hovering in that to 10 to 12 cents. So I think there is sort of a foot on the chest of RavenQuest that this will help out relieve some of that pressure off that, uh, that our shareholders know that we've taken a look at this thing in a very rigorous manner. And we responded rigorously and we've also taken a very aggressive step back at them and said, uh, you've got to defend your own patents. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, George, can you tell me, like, is there, are there other sort of uh, orbital garden type of devices that would support your idea that, hey, these patents aren't valid because this technology is in use elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, I'm not getting into too much detail, but uh, we did a worldwide search of all the orbital gardens that are currently in place, the ones that has had patents placed against them, the ones that are just out there operating and working uh, without patent claims. Uh, we did the research that the prosecutors looked through and their researches of uh, what they see in this patent, but over 29 manufacturers worldwide are, are making uh, orbital gardens, and they've been doing it since before the 70s. But much of the claims that are out there are really sort of dealing with things that are just prior art uh, from the way that you remove heat from any type of device um, to the point of which how you just sort of manage a garden. So uh, 29 manufacturers worldwide, uh, 350 some odd uh, previous claims of patent or uh, notes about uh, patent capabilities that are out there. So this is something that's dealt with with prior art and we feel very comfortable moving forward that this is now uh, in front of the courts but mostly behind us. Wow, okay, in that case let's talk about the future of Raven Quest Bio. What do, you, uh, what do you see happening for 2020 that's really going to get the gears spinning for the, for the company and the stock? Yeah, you know, I spent the last two or three weeks uh, meeting with uh, the, uh, many, many of the large shareholders of RavenQuest. I'm looking for them to see what they would like 2020 to look like for RavenQuest, because really uh, we have, you know, many stakeholders, Health Canada, our, our patients and consumers, and our shareholders. And they were really quite clear to me. They want us to focus on uh, that we are a technology company that grows cannabis. They want us to really push 
our technologies that we have. They want us to bring them front and forward to the market in 2020 and really find ways of leveraging that part of our conversation our story, uh, and our story with uh, the market to make sure people understand that we are just not a cannabis growing company, but we've got lots of technologies that we use, we deploy, that makes us an extremely different uh, provider of consulting services, of technologies to, to many companies. Uh, and we can extend that offer now, not only here, but nationally, internationally, uh, and now we're not. Uh, we're going to now start chasing after the U.S. market. Sure, you've been making some advances in getting your technology deployed to other locations around the world. How much of the global opportunity do you see uh, accruing to uh, RavenQuest's sort of uh, financials in 2020? You know, it's a, it's a big thing for us right now. We're getting lots of calls from uh, Europe. Uh, we've had a couple of calls from Australia, people wanting to use the technology under the same sort of agreements we're working with Cannabis BioCare, which is joint ventures, which we will come in, supply the technology, operate the facility, design the facility, and find the staffing for it. This is becoming a very interesting business model, as I think many people have tried to do the standard uh, way of doing business, which is hire 10 or 12 consultants, try and put something together, rather than to turn key solutions. So what does it look for in 2020? I'm going to look at some gardening sales, if I can see it, and if it all comes together, you know, somewhere in the 20 to $40 million in 2020, just in garden sales, uh, and through leasing and royalty uh, agreements. So let's make sure let's make sure we're not over promising here. But right now, that's what looks like it's in front of us. That's the deals that are sort of uh, starting to firm up for us. So uh, that's very promising. Let alone the royalty we get off the cannabis that comes off the gardens in these facilities. Sure. And uh, the cannabis 2.0 situation that is now sort of delayed a bit until January. Uh, do you see that as we progress towards it becoming more of a uh, revenue booster for LPs or is it going to be selective or is it going to be a dud? Well, you know, I think there's a lot of bits and pieces to this. 747 SKUs for vape pens have been, for example, have been provided to Health Canada. If that's not just sort of going to make an interesting choices for consumers, I don't know who's going to win with that many products coming into the market, let alone all the different mints and other stuff coming in. I think the best thing for uh, for us, at least for RavenQuest, is to step back and let this kind of all sort itself out. First mover is not uh, didn't work for the flower market for legalization because much of the quality uh, was questioned by the consumer groups. I think the same things out there. I think you're going to see a lot of people try this new product out, but is it going to really meet the demands or what they're going to look for? I don't know. I think they're going to jump around for a little bit. That I don't know, but I don't think it's a big push, at least for the first couple of quarters. In fact, what we're going to do is maybe in a position again in 120 days, if that product doesn't sell, is it coming back as, as the new uh, contracts are listed for the provincial governments? If you cannot sort of move the product in 120 days, uh, the provincial governments are going to ship it back to you. And I just, uh, I just think that's going to be tough with so many products coming to the market in January. Yeah, especially isn't there isn't there a best before date issue with even cannabis edible products that really if the government ships it back to you after three months, it's not like you're going to be able to try to find a new a new home for it. Yeah, at least you can repurpose flour a little bit. If it's just uh, not a product recall, but just a return, you can repurpose the flour. But these other products, uh, they're going to have shelf life issues. They're going to have a best uh, before dates on them. I just think it's something that when you take a look at it, uh, I think, it, you know, the consumer packaged good markets for chocolate bars and, and uh, gummies that don't have THC and CBD, they understand the turn rates. I don't think we do yet. So I think this is going to be the real question is, is uh, how much risk are you going to put on your books of product returns coming in? And I think just right now the consumers are really, really quite happy with uh, the flower, and we're going to stay in that uh, that place with the pre rolls. Sure. Well, that sounds like an intelligent move to me. So, uh, George, we'll leave it there for now. We'll come back to you in due course. Thanks very much for your participation as usual. And thanks for giving me some time again, James. If you're enjoying the show, subscribe to Midas Letter on YouTube so you stay up to date on everything investment. Here is our last show of the year, people. I hope that you are enjoying this new one day a week format, because we sure are. But this next holiday we're about to take, we're probably not going to see you all till January the 10th in 2020. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Feliz Navidad, and we'll see you next week.
Thank you.